And I'm gonna start, even though people are still joining us because we're really good and respectful of your time. The, the power in this plaza here today is extraordinary. Um, 2021 must be one of empowerment. And One Billion Rising and the scale of family are leading the way, not only with their financial resources, but with their human spirit resources, helping us to connect with like-minded people like you all here today, who are gathered here with a pragmatic belief in our collective ability to move the needle and to make our community a place where gender equity opens up exponential opportunities for us to truly thrive. So for those of you who don't know, One Billion Rising does have an eight year history collaborating with the Women's Fund, co-founding the Freedom From Violence monthly convenings together with the former programs director, the fabulous Fran Katz. We birthed this convening together and we met with many, many, many of you for many years. Uh, many of you were speakers, all of you were sharing at the YWCA. And that grew and grew and grew as you said that it was important for you to be experts and for you to know your work and for focus and for sometimes staying in your lane, but the getting out of silos and collaborating was absolutely essential. We listened and this uh, Freedom from Violence Coalition turned into what is now the impact collaboratives because we added Women's Fund's other three pillars, not only freedom from violence, economic mobility, health and well-being and leadership are all key for gender equity and for women and girls to be able to thrive. And we thank you all for iterating and creating and bringing us to where we are today. So many of you are service providers and amazing civil servants. Uh, your services are represented here in these cards, uh, the Coordinated Victims Assistance Center, um, 211, 911, Polaris, the state attorney's office, uh, 305 Fix Stop. All of these resources are here and we can get to you because we share the resources. Now, I also wanna give a big old thank you to Football Unites because January is the one year anniversary of your sponsorship. And we thank you for this vital fuel of the Women's Fund and your partnership on activities throughout the year. Speaking of thank yous, thank you for being here, Judge Carol Kelly, representatives of Grace Court, representatives of the office of Senator Lauren Book, and your Miami-Dade County Commissioners and Mayor represented by the Miami-Dade Commission for Women. School Board Member, Dr. Dorothy Bendros Mindingal, and the human superstars who staff the service providing agencies gathered here today. Board members, talk about time and talent. We have a lot in our board now and many, many, many shoulders that we're standing on of amazing uh, women and men uh, from the past and new incoming board members to come hopefully in upcoming months. I have to also say that the national representatives of the Women's Funding Network are joining us here today because we're all connected and this is not the only Women's Fund and we all together work to be stronger. So now it is not only my personal privilege, but my privilege uh, in the name of all of the board and the staff of the Women's Fund to welcome our keynote speaker and to thank her in all of our names for generously sharing not only her wisdom, but her strength and her leadership with us today. The new executive director of In Our Backyard, Cheryl Chickie. Cheryl. Thank you. It's great to be here. 2012, I became aware of human trafficking, sitting in a seat like yours, listening to founder, Nita Bells of In Our Backyard. I'm hoping right now you are thinking about the first time you became aware of human trafficking and first felt you had to do something about it. Maybe your heart heats up your chest. Maybe your stomach starts to slowly turn over within itself 
because the image of a child sitting in a room while a large body enters through the door makes your mind want to scream no further what is wrong with the world. Probably just the idea of malnourished, deceived, trapped, ill-promised, desperation, or even loyal, loving family members dedicated to their own kin by surrendering to the conditions most privileged citizens have never even thought of make your neck cringe, especially when you start to think of a child being born into this pain and neglect of healthcare, especially into a cycle that never ends. If you haven't stood up to say, what can I do now? Let me continue. I remember being eight, then nine, 10, 11, and 12, having a conversation with my own mind. Do you do that? <laughs> How can I ask this person who I think can help me without actually telling them? This is the pure and innocent thought of a child being abused and exploited, and it's me. I had no language. In fact, I didn't have any language for 30 years of the camera that stalked me during my abuse until I met someone and she linked arms with me. I was able to begin to tell the broken pieces of my story so that others would never endure it again and others could help the cause. If you have experienced any trauma, small T trauma or uppercase big T trauma, I want you to find just one word and challenge you to describe it every second. It's nearly impossible and your time is already up. Your body has no language for injustice, but I see you here today. Even the silence that you can hear in my voice is telling you a story. Even the silence that you hear of a victim saying, I am a victim of trafficking without words. Sometimes it's the silence. Each of us today, Responding to the silence is not a responsibility given, it's a responsibility taken. We choose to take the responsibility because of your courage to face human trafficking and respond to action. And when you or they don't have language, we bring action. Each of us in the movement to end human trafficking lead through the silence. This past year has brought new challenges and responsibilities to link arms and take on. Let's reflect on 2020. Let's now add to the cause scarcity as a nation, desperation, more suffering, especially on the hands that control, provide and feed someone exploited. It only gets worse, friends. Less shelter or more harm? Do those feel like choices? Are you starting to hear their voice break the silence and hopefully yours too? In our backyard in 2020, decided to respond to the silence in classrooms our Teens Against Trafficking program transformed virtually and is now led peer to peer, including a focus group of teens. We linked arms with them. Our trainings have reached over 17,000 people this year, working from home and able to link arms with us from coast to coast. Our convenience store against trafficking program has blown through every boundary we can imagine. They have stayed essential businesses 
the eyes and ears of a community with 20,000 stores across America trained to report and have freedom stickers posted in their restrooms with the National Human Trafficking Hotline. They have become the eyes and ears for a safer community. And in those restrooms, over 4 million people are reached every day. It's good news. In just less than a month, we'll be setting up a 10-day operation for our uh, surrounding Super Bowl efforts to eradicate human trafficking. We usually have one room of in-person law enforcement, top intelligence teams, nonprofits, civilians and volunteers in person. This year and the challenges it had, had us face and overcome, we've extended four virtual rooms of support to help us at this command post this year. We try our best every year to reach and recover missing and exploited children. I have good sights on this year coming. COVID 2020 has changed us, has it not? You might not even have language for it. Today, I challenge you to listen to the whisper of linking arms in 2021. We need each other to end human trafficking. Today at the Women's Fund, we need to be the wind beneath your wings. And honey, let me tell you, I am a gust. I am a child. Sorry. I am a child survivor who virtually stands before you, but to join you, to thank you, and to tell you, you can do something, and that no pandemic can stop human trafficking, but together linking arms, we can, you can. Link arms, it only makes survivors stronger. Linking arms, it only makes us wiser. And linking arms, because together, we can take responsibility and respond to the silence with action. When we link arms together in 2021, friends, you will be the wind. Thank you. Thank you. We are so linked and you're right. It's the wings together. Cheryl, not only are you an amazing leader, congratulations in your new role as executive director, but working together in the ground with you, running to, to, to stores and working on the Super Bowl here with the Stop Sex Trafficking Campaign of the Miami Super Bowl Host Committee. It's just the beginning of so much collaboration. The, the individuals, Moms like me, regular folks, and people from the Coast Guard are here, people from social services. There's a gentleman from the airport. There's so many people who are gonna have their eyes peeled and that you're, you're gonna, your story and your strength are gonna go with all of us today. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. And we're gonna invite Cheryl back at the end for the Q and A as well. So our panelists will, will speak first, but we want you to know now how this is all gonna work. We need you to participate. We have genius here in this community plaza. So chat with one another. Please participate in the polls. Please, please, please do the survey when you leave because data makes a difference. Data, research, input, it all makes a difference. We need your opinions. Please, as you go to poll number one, allow me to ask each of our panelists to now introduce their incredible selves in only two minutes. Yes, just two minutes to please introduce yourselves in context of today's topic. Molly Thorson, thank you so much for being here. Molly. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with the Women's Fund. We um, really enjoyed working with you last year leading up to Super Bowl uh, 54. And Cheryl, that was um, so wonderful to get to hear you speak. I'm really looking forward to all the work we're going to be doing 
for Super Bowl 55 together. Um, so I am Molly Thorson. I am with A21 and I am the US Advocacy Director. Um, A21 is a global nonprofit that operates in 18 different offices within 13 different countries. We work in reach, rescue, restoration, survivor services, education. Um, and here in the US, we do a lot of our um, adv advocacy campaigns, which is how I'm linked up with the Women's Fund. Um, and my specific topic this morning will be um, child online exploitation. Um, during the pandemic, we're obviously seeing a rise in online programs and online uses and really just um, a lot more engagement in social media. So I'll be speaking a little bit more about that issue with child online exploitation. Thank you so much. Claudia, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'll be a little quicker on this round. So my name is Claudia Navarro. I'm the Deputy Director at WeCount. Um, we are a community organization based in South Dade, and um, we, um, you can move to the next slide. Uh, so we have um, our membership, which we focus on three key industries, domestic workers, day laborers, and agriculture workers with our vision uh, to build a grassroots movement for fair jobs and papers for all. And so our work is mainly done on three uh, broad approaches. The first is outreach and education. The second is social and legal services. And the third is advocacy and organizing. And so there's a lot of bullet points that I won't quite get into. Um, and so in the context of the work that we do, since one of our key industries is domestic work, um, we have and uh, continue to work with uh, domestic workers who are uh, labor trafficked. Um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, and so on any given day, 25 million uh, people are forced into labor situations globally. Um, and we know of the 25 million that is obviously underreported, the largest share of labor trafficking cases, about 24% um, from Polaris Project, uh, estimates for it to be in domestic work. Um, you could move two slides. Um, and so in the United States broadly, um, B1 domestic worker visas, which is a, a category specific for uh, domestic worker visas, is ranked as the number one category uh, for complaints in labor trafficking and domestic uh, workers. Um, and so we'll, we'll go into that about uh, the context of South Florida and how we see it um, and how we see it here. So really excited to have this conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much for your work and for being here. Victor Williams. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Victor Williams. My current role is the coordinator for the Georgia Coalition to Combat Human Trafficking. It is the first grant-funded um, uh, law enforcement um, task force to address human trafficking here in Georgia. Um, Georgia does have a statewide human trafficking task force that's been in place for years, but again, the Georgia Coalition to Combat Human Trafficking is the first um, federal funded law enforcement. So um, GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is our um, lead law enforcement agency. Um, we have the Attorney General's Office Human Trafficking Unit is the um, um, prosecutor for the task force and then our service providers that partners. We all sit at a table. It has been an incredible experience um, being part of a statewide um, human trafficking task force addressing it from a state position. So it's been great. My history is I'm a retired federal agent with Homeland Security Investigations. My last eight years of my career, I worked in South Florida. Six of those eight years, I was the coordinator for the South Florida Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, Learned a lot, changed my life as I grew and learned about human trafficking. I address human trafficking from a cultural standpoint. Um, everything we do, most of everything we do, we can look back and attach it to some type of cultural belief. And so my thing with human trafficking is, you know, the way we're gonna fix this is to change ourselves individually, because we're all responsible. You know, um, when it comes down to 
uh, you know, us buying products from slave labor, we're all responsible if we don't know what we're buying. Those are usually my messages to connect people. So once we can change the culture by educating people, the next step is to change laws and policies that will fit into that. And the last thing it always comes back to is us us making decisions, but we can only make those decisions with good information, being educated. And, and I'll leave it at that and have further discussions later. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Many of uh, the folks from the South Florida Human Trafficking Task Force and the Miami-Dade Coalition for Human Trafficking that you participated in as well are also here today. So I'm sure everybody's saying a virtual <laughs> hello, Vic. Um, Michelle Ortiz, Americans for Immigrant Justice, amazing work. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for putting this panel together. Um, my name is Michelle Ortiz. I'm the Deputy Director at Americans for Immigrant Justice. We are a uh, nonprofit legal services organization dedicated to protect, protecting the human rights of immigrants. Um, our Lucha program focuses on providing free uh, immigration assistance to uh, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. It was founded in 1997, actually as a result of a pretty large human trafficking case. This was before the term human trafficking existed. Um, back then we called it slavery, modern day slavery. Uh, there was no federal statute protecting immigrant survivors of human trafficking. Um, the case was actually a, a pretty large network of sex trafficking where immigrant women were forced to service up to 130 men a day. In some instances, um, some of the survivors were as young as 14 years old. Um, we worked really closely with the US Attorney's Office and the FBI. Um, one of the interesting things about that case is that it really, um, I think, brought to light uh, the plight of immigrant survivors of human trafficking and the need for federal protections for immigrant survivors. At the time, there was um, no existing protections for these individuals um, who had suffered so much. In fact, the victims in this case were being detained by immigration. They were in immigration detention, and it was a really long, hard fight um, to uh, request their release and convince the immigration authorities to allow them to stay. Unfortunately, many, many, many years later, we were able to obtain legal status for them once federal protections um, were uh, codified in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We continue um, to represent immigrant survivors of sex trafficking and labor trafficking throughout South Florida, sometimes statewide, and work very closely um, with the Miami-Dade County uh, Coordinated Victims Assistance Center with Homeland Security Investigations um, and other local law enforcement and social service providers to ensure that our clients are protected from deportation and also uh, receiving all the services that they're entitled to under federal law. Amazing, amazing. So many people working together here on the screen and here in our audience, I don't even like to say audience, our participants who are here in our village square together with you all today. So now we're going to issues and uh, we're gonna ask each panelist to address key issues that they're seeing today and now. There's nothing boring about the impact collaboratives. We wanna know what's what you're seeing, what's going on in times of COVID, what's happening, especially because of quarantine. Uh, be straight, be, be clear with us, please. Uh, we're here because we have many loops yet to close. If this problem were fixed, uh, we wouldn't all be here today. And so uh, no problem, please tell us the big issues that you see. And we're gonna start with you, please, Molly. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I believe I have a few slides. Um, we're gonna start first with a video of um, our public awareness campaign that's being implemented throughout the United States right now called Can You See Me? Um, Can You See Me was designed, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can You See Me was designed to highlight what is happening with online child exploitation um, and kind of give an overview of what those indicators look like. 
Um, right now, this campaign has launched it's over a thousand billboards roadside across the United States, as well as airports across the United States and um, being shown in plenty of platforms and social media as well as education. Um, so if you don't mind clicking the video to play. Molly, I think that was only a picture. We didn't get a, a, an actual video link. But oh, if what? you send it to me, we can uh, try. Let's see. Yes. So sorry, that is embedded in there. If you want, Molly, what you can do is uh, talk about this. Uh, we can put that in your solutions part in the okay, next part. Great. We'll finish with the Wonderful. issue part and we'll we'll prep it for, for then. Good. Wonderful. So basically this is a scenario and this was based off of um, a real case and where a child was um, playing a video game online and was being contacted by a trafficker um, in a scenario where he thought it was just another gamer. The trafficker is contacting the child asking for um, illicit photos. The child then gives the illicit photos and then um, is, is basically becoming um, manipulated by this trafficker through a gaming system. So really what it's highlighting is that human trafficking is really changing quickly in the way that we're looking at how traffickers can infiltrate um, to the victims. So this is one of the um, many ways that children are being um, exploited and manipulated online. And I'm looking forward to showing you the video because it, it has a very great depiction of what happens. Um, but like I was saying, this was based off of a real case. Um, so this is happening all across the United States. In this scenario, um, the call to action is 1-800-THE-LOSS, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's hotline number. Um, and we were able to pull some stats from those. Um, so basically one in every six runaway children were likely victims of child sex trafficking. So when we think about missing and exploited children, um, a great deal, one six of those are most likely going to be um, exploited sexually children. Um, looking at the numbers in 2019, there were 16.9 million total reports that were from basically social media and online platforms alone. So that's a, a really large number when you're looking at just online and from these platforms. Um, those 16.9 million reports, um, 15,884,511 511 were from Facebook alone. So you're looking at all of these different ways traffickers are infiltrating. This is a, a huge online platform where pretty much the majority of our nation participates in. So it, it's really becoming, um, it, it's shifting and you're seeing that traffickers are getting on these everyday platforms that our children across the United States are also on and it's becoming easier for traffickers to infiltrate into vulnerable populations through these online platforms. Um, in that 16.9 million reports, there were over 69.1 million images, videos, and other files related to child sexual exploitation. So those reports are having a lot of evidence to support them, and you're seeing that these children are being used over and over again in different scenarios. Um, and different um, media types. So um, that's a little bit about what the issue is. Um, obviously it goes into not just online, um, but child exploitation in a large form, but specifically with the pandemic, you're seeing an increase of children learning online. You're seeing children at home online. You're seeing children playing video games and really just using online presence as this fill-in for um, this lack of um, being able to be together. So um, it's something that we're really keeping an eye on and something that we're really working hard to combat. And um, I look forward to going into the solution here shortly. As I said before, our school board member, Dr. Dorothy Bendras Mindingal is with us here today. We have people from many faith-based organizations and a lot of parents. So the urgency that you give us with this current iteration, true 
uh, feedback from right now, Molly, is absolutely priceless. And I know everybody here today is going to share it. Um, now we ask Claudia, can, can you tell us what you're seeing at WeCount? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, to, to continue on, um, B1 domestic workers are by and large um, what we consider to be an invisible crisis here in South Florida. Um, we estimate that there are about 200,000 domestic workers um, living and working here. Um, and so we see here that um, the majority of these B1 domestic workers work in secluded apartments, um, in homes and neighborhoods that are not easily accessible. Um, and then there's no effective monitoring or accountability. And, um, and, and I think the, the, the biggest part of our analysis is that these B1 domestic workers, their visas are directly tied to their employment. And so because of that, there's an extra level of fear and intimidation and abuse that is tied by this, this tied visa policy. And then in addition to that, um, these workers don't have a pathway um, to more stable uh, citizenship or residency, right? And so our analysis is that um, these workers are essentially part of what we consider to be structured trafficking. When you have a system that allows uh, workers to be contracted elsewhere out of the radar um, and without sort of, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in, in policy solutions, without a way to know who exactly holds these visas and knowing that they're not receiving adequate education on what their rights are. Um, and, with, and, and in addition to that, inadequate labor enforcement and immigration protections overall, we often see that um, people are not adequately trained to understand how to identify the complexities of what it seems to be um, a, a person who is uh, being labor trafficked under domestic servitude. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, the largest share of, of um, of folks in labor trafficking are domestic servitude. And so if we move forward a little bit, um, like we've seen, and it's been a continuing conversation with all of COVID, it's just been exacerbated. Um, the things that we have already been seeing, right? Increased uh, unsafe working conditions. We've received reports from members and community members um, that the same restrictions that are being placed uh, on domestic workers are not being enforced uh, by their employees, right? So there's more control movement, um, and there's higher fear of retaliation, um, not to talk about wage stuff and exploitation. And in addition to that travel related issues, we did have um, domestic workers that had B1 domestic visas that, um, that had family members being able to visit. And now those things and those conditions are sort of being um, extremely exacerbated. And so I think um, one of the things that we've just been seeing is uh, the lack of, of services and um, not being able to reach domestic workers because oftentimes they aren't on the social media platforms, they aren't on internet and they're um, and, and the extreme isolation of COVID-19. So I'm excited to talk about policy solutions. <laughs> yes, and we all are to share them later. Uh, fascinating. Thank you for telling us what's really going down. Victor. <clears throat> there you go. Um, I know we had this discussion and what the, you know, the first two panelists mentioned where they see issues. I mean, I see it from, you know, the statewide coordinator. I see it from everywhere. Um, my job here um, as a coordinator of this coalition is to get this entire state on the same page. Um, right now, my biggest challenge is educating, educating law enforcement um, so that they can see what the issues are, so they can learn what it looks like. We have set up what you do, but what we realize, even in what I do over the past um, holidays here that we've crossed path, paths with um, victims, well, at least one, that we have holes in our what to do. Um, the, one of the biggest issues I see is that we're operating in silos. Everybody's doing great work. The problem is, is how do we bring us all together? Um, when I look at it from the state, when I, well, at least from when I was um, working in South Florida, 
you know, and as I learned, and as I was going on my way, learning about this process, um, I realized how, what a big part the community plays. Um, every, I never said no, you know, when someone asked, can you come to my church on Sunday? Can you come to my school on Saturday? You know, can you come to my house for a big party? I never said no, because I felt like that was my job is to really connect with the community. And, and doing that, I mean, South Florida, and, and it's still, Florida itself is one of the, you know, leading states in the country addressing this issue. But they're in silos from the South Florida Human Trafficking Task Force to the Big Ben um, Task Force that's doing great work. And we're going to collaborate with them later on in the month and do a similar presentation and talk about how we could come together. Um, you talk about the internet problems. Um, I think I would mention this in preparing um, in Fort Lauderdale itself. One of, you know, you have a, a great organization, the Broward Human Trafficking Coalition. Uh, the leader of that coalition is um, Jamar Johnson. And I can remember working with them for years. And one of the things that they found out, and it happened to be the only place in the country that I know that are getting numbers like they are getting. And I couldn't even make that connection in Dade. And the connection was, they can tell you how many victims of human trafficking they had in that city. They can tell you exactly what, what part of the city they came from. But the striking thing about what they found every year is that no matter what their numbers were, 80 to 90% of the victims were community kids. Meaning they're kids that are not um, part of the DJJ system. They didn't necessarily come from a poor or at-risk home. Matter of fact, I believe there was a judge whose 16 year old daughter was groomed online to make a point how important it is to understand what your kids are doing online. And she was trafficked for six or seven months before they got her back, but she was groomed online. And you say, um, there's a lot of parents here. Um, I love talking to parents because the one thing that I wanna let them know is that if your child cannot tell you the worst thing in the world that's going on in their lives, that's a problem because who else they supposed to tell? And a lot of times these kids are open to the, the stuff that are happening on the internet because we're, we're missing a certain connection. And, I, and I, again, I take everything in this process back to culture. Maybe how we were raised as kids, we're gonna raise our kids. All I know parents, we better have a better relationship with our kids that we could connect with them, that they can trust us, that they can tell us things that they normally wouldn't, that we couldn't even tell our parents. So when we talk about these issues, um, again, from my perspective, another issue I see is that this information is coming from the ground up. So that means our leaders are still not educated in a way where they have power to make change, to do certain things, but they're not making the connection as the people are on the ground. Um, whenever I'm, you know, when I first retired and I was traveling around the country educating law, law enforcement departments on this, I mean, we wanted to have, you know, management in that room, not just the guys that are doing the investigations, because when you work in human trafficking trust, you would change. The only way you're gonna understand it, it, it requires a change in us because our culture has been letting this happen overseeing things, participating in ways we don't even know, but because it was cool and everybody was doing it, we kind of just, okay, let it go. Um, one of, one of the, the, the slides that I have in my presentation, and, and um, let me know when I get close that I have to stop. I know it's only a three minute thing, but one of the slides that I used to use in my presentation, well, I still use it, is a slide of me in a pimp outfit for Halloween. And I used to ask the audience before I showed this picture, how many of you guys have ever dressed up, you know, for Halloween and, you know, nobody would show. And I, and I would show this picture just to make a point that even us on this panel, you know, we didn't wake up knowing this stuff. However, it came to us and we continue to fight and learn, it changes you. So in order to really understand this requires a level of education that changes you. Because as some of the panels mentioned, well, Cheryl mentioned before, it's gonna take a collective fight. All of us gotta be on the same page. And it's easy. 
It's just being on that page and being educated in a way that you understand it. We all know human trafficking is bad. I don't need to see another victim to know that this is a problem, but it does start with us and how far we want to go with it determines you know, how much it impacts us. I don't have to have a victim. I don't have to have no victim or have a child that's a victim to understand how serious that it can happen to anyone, anytime. So <clears throat> ending up, it, it really comes down to education and understanding it from a level that it, it, it's not hidden anywhere in our society. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it with that and come back with solutions later. That's, Thank you. that's brilliant. Thank you, Vic. And I think we're going to get to see um, Michelle now. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we see human trafficking manifest in our immigrant communities. Um, you know, I, I would say that we see it kind of in, in three different ways. So we see individuals who may have lived in the United States for a long time and um, were not brought here as a result of human trafficking. Maybe they came on a tourist visa or some other visa or are undocumented and find themselves either in a, a labor trafficking situation um, in, in domestic work, as Claudia mentioned, we, we see that very often, um, in agricultural work, um, in, in cleaning service contract labor, um, or in sex trafficking. We all often also see a lot of intersections between domestic violence and human trafficking, be it sex trafficking or labor trafficking, where a spouse or a boyfriend um, is really using part of, part of the domestic violence power and control is to force them to engage in labor, whether that be you know, um, the, the labor we've mentioned or labor in the, in the sense of sex trafficking. Um, as for more recently arrived immigrants, um, we are seeing an increase and have seen an increase in the last few years of individuals and, and particularly children who are forced to pay off, let's say a smuggling debt. So a parent may have arranged for a child uh, to be brought by a coyote and when the child arrives in the United States, they're taken um, to an, a, a farm or a, we've even seen it in factories and in chicken processing plants to pay off the debt that their um, parents had agreed to on their behalf to bring them to the United States. Um, finally, we have seen a lot of individuals, including many children who have um, come to the United States, presented themselves at the southern border seeking asylum in the United States as a result of having been trafficked in the home country. While we've seen these increases, uh, particularly in individuals who are um, seeking protection from the United States, we have unfortunately seen a rollback of immigration protections for immigrant victims of human trafficking. So recently, um, the administration passed new regulations related to asylum that make it virtually impossible for any victim of human trafficking to request and be granted asylum in the United States as a result of having been trafficked. This is a huge setback um, for the rights of immigrant survivors of human trafficking. In addition, we've seen rollbacks in terms of protections for uh, trafficking victims who were victimized inside the United States who may have an application for a T visa pending. So a T visa is um, the form of immigration status that has been uh, designed by Congress to ensure that immigrant victims of human trafficking who suffered their trafficking inside the United States are not detained or deported and it's a pathway to lawful permanent residence. Unfortunately, what we've seen in the last few years is that having this type of application pending, even when law enforcement has endorsed it, is not going to necessarily protect you from detention and deportation. In fact, last June, we had a victim of human trafficking who was detained at one of our local ICE facilities. Uh, we prepared a uh, T visa application for her. She cooperated with law enforcement in the investigation. 
ICE would not release her from detention, even though she had a T visa pending, even though the detention facility was riddled with COVID and her health was at risk. We requested that the T visa be expedited and she was deported only for the visa to be approved after her deportation. And there's a complex immigration law um, point, but once she's deported, she can't come back. That visa is no good, right? So unfortunately, while we have seen that, you know, human trafficking has not gone, gone away, it's manifesting itself in different ways. Um, we're seeing that the federal protections for immigrant survivors that we have fought so hard for have only been rolled back, um, putting trafficking victims further at risk. Explosive. Thank you, Michelle. Really, really important for us to be cognizant of the realities, the current realities, and especially during COVID. Um, the next section, again, three minutes each with solutions, but Molly, I think we have your video. Is that right, Vivi? If so, please go ahead and roll it. Almost there. Almost there. Okay. It's a one minute video, so I should be within your. Don't worry, Molly. This is all great. And a shout out to Viviana and Carolina and our interns and all the amazing staff. Thank you all for making this run. We love you, Women's Fund folks. Here you go. Thank you. And thank you, Victor, for saying that because um, this whole time you've been saying how education is the key into like even just beginning a process to end human trafficking. Um, and that's really what our goal and our solution is with this Can You See Me campaign. Um, Can You See Me was designed to kind of show the indicators of trafficking in a way that's really relatable um, and a way that you probably haven't seen it um, in a public awareness campaign before. And Victor mentioned earlier, human trafficking is often hidden in plain sight. We've heard time after time, I never felt seen from survivors. So the goal is to say, we see you and we see this happening and we are working um, to try and end it. So um, our solution for child online exploitation as and I hate even saying that because that's, there's no real um, one solution here, but what we're working on is um, education. So as I mentioned earlier, this Can You See Me campaign is roadside billboards in over a thousand roadsides. I'm very happy to say we do have some in Georgia, Victor. So we're really happy about that as well as um, Florida to the Women's Fund. Um, and we're working tirelessly to get these into schools and to educate children. Um, about the dangers of communicating with strangers online. Um, what we're also really working on is to build up this education within the world of parents and the parents' communications. So we have a parent prevention guide at a21.org where we're showcasing the indicators to parents. So parents can be at home and be on the lookout for what their child is being a part of online, what games they're playing, what social media sites they're on, and just making sure that they're protective and that they are providing that first layer of defense um, to those traffickers who are trying to infiltrate through social media and through an online presence. 
Um, so really that's, that's kind of the solution we're working towards is the education aspect and kind of educating the community that it's now 2021. Every time we put up a line of defense to a trafficker, they're constantly working to find a new entry point to these vulnerable populations. So we constantly need to be updating our education on what human trafficking looks like and educating ourselves on the new ways traffickers can find um, the vulnerable people. Um, so that first key is education. And um, I would encourage everyone to go to a21.org uh, to look at the Can You See Me campaign and our parent prevention guides on how you can educate your children and how you can educate yourself as a parent. Um, and we are working on getting these nationwide into as many states as we can. Um, so if you are interested in bringing Can You See Me into your state or into your school, um, I am more than happy to help uh, facilitate that. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. And our staff is working with these solutions. So we'll be posting some of these later on social media. In addition to have all of this that could be shared, people can review what's being recorded today. And to that point, we go to you, Claudia, because you had given some very specific uh, calls to action. And as you speak, I'm letting everybody know that please, as you listen, do answer our second poll because this data is priceless. To you, Claudia, please. Thank you so much. And so um, I think to, to, to follow, right, we know that um, the majority of the work that needs to be done is education and outreach. Um, and so it looks different, different ways um, in the way that we're imagining it. So the number one thing I think that we need to be focusing on, uh, particularly for folks that have been labor trafficked, is vaccine distribution. You know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. These are essential employees um, that are laboring, right? The second one is we believe that uh, local government should be investing in community-based organizations to be able to do the outreach and education into the community. We should be investing in this work. Um, the third, and I think, uh, one of the most salient is an employer database, right? Like I mentioned earlier, there is no register uh, registry um, of B1 domestic workers so that we as community-based organizations can do outreach to those uh, specific people um, to ensure that they aren't being labor trafficked, that they aren't um, being exploited. And then the fourth, right, we talked, um, um, uh, Michelle talked a little bit about UNT visa certification, right? Um, there are 5,000 T visas being approved every year. There's 25 million uh, people who suffer labor exploitation. Like the numbers are not matching up and we need to be doing more um, federally with UNT visa certification um, and wage theft, right? Because just because you receive a T or U visa does not necessarily mean that you're gonna be recovering all the wages of all the, of all the, um, of all the labor that you were exploited. So we can move to the next slide. And I think um, the fifth one in sort of the, the first, five are about mitigating harm is when folks do get approved these um, worker visas to implement worker training and monitoring requirements, right? A lot of times we hear often that workers didn't know that they were being trafficked, thought that it was normal for their passport and for their documents to be taken, thought it was normal for their movement to be restricted because they didn't know otherwise. They didn't know what their rights were. Um, and we had one case that we worked with um, a couple of years ago where the document was signed, the wages were signed, right? The co contract with the US government was signed and, and, the, and the employer employee didn't know that they had the right of the minimum wage or whatever the wage was that was agreed on, right? And so we think that that's really important. And then I think the sixth one is more about reimagining um, our entire immigration movement, right? We know that um, with labor trafficking and, and like Michelle mentioned, right, we have that bondage. We have a lot of people who come in and continue to be exploited in a, in a variety of ways. And I think by reimagining what our immigration system is and not having visas tied to workers and to employment, um, that we can, we can really tackle what labor trafficking looks like. Um, and that's my three minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Victor, we're going to ask you for solutions, and I'm going to prime the pump by saying, uh, 
Rachel Turgeman had asked if you could give, you know, data. Do we know data of what's going on, especially during COVID? And I know that when you and I and Carolina spoke earlier, data and lack of cohesive data and communication can be an issue. So I'm gonna lead you with that. <laughs> so yeah, um, we one of the interesting things that <clears throat> and you know, working in Florida where my heart was and where I learned and where I grew in this space always thought everybody was behind us on everything dealing with human trafficking, especially Georgia, because I remember when 2016, when we passed the first law to stop arresting underage kids, it took us 16 years to figure that out, to stop arresting kid, underage kids for prostitution. Georgia had just passed the safe harbor. I was like, man, they're so behind, you know? And just last year, 2019, they finally passed a law that prohibits law enforcement for arresting underage kids um, for prostitution. And so I was like, man, you know, Georgia's really behind. But now working on scene, seeing behind the scenes, they've done a lot of great work here. Um, I work for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, which is a part of the government that is the administrative part. They deal with all victim services. They provide funding, they get grants. They, I mean, they are probably the most important part of Georgia's government and getting things done. So working for CJCC really upgraded my knowledge and what needs to be in place. So one of the things that CJCC has is a, a statistical analytic unit. You know what? I stopped giving numbers because we give the same numbers and we don't even know the resources of those numbers. You know, kids under the, you know, 12 years old, you know, the average age. And then when you try to go back to find who gave that number, is that a real statistic? Nobody can find the resources. So we stop trying to use numbers that everybody's been using because everybody use them and start giving more facts. So our statistical analytic unit is amazing. And every state need, needs one. They get information from the Department of Labor. And this is just an example of how they work. They'll get violations of immigration, visa, wage, all of that, which if you got a certain company that having a lot of those violations can point you to a certain area. <clears throat> so Mario Mar wanted me to talk about you know, numbers. Those are our numbers. Those are our state numbers. And I'm not saying that we don't have accurate national numbers, because I know Polaris get their numbers from the calls that they get. Very good information. But to really understand what's going on in your state and in your neighborhood, you really have to have somebody looking at numbers to point you in the direction where the issues really are. So um, those are one of many solutions that I found that Georgia's really, um, and that, that really jumped the gun and so we're being really um, specific in the areas where we send our investigators. We're being specific in the areas because everybody that's on our panel, that's part of the coalition, have access to this information. So whatever part you are working in human trafficking, you can go on this system, <clears throat> you can punch in, the state is broken down. I got 159 counties. Each county has its own, own report and we could be so specific. So. There's a lot more solutions, but this is one that I think <clears throat> every state could try, try to find um, access to numbers to give you specifics of what's going on. So I think that's the end of my three minutes. <laughs> You're a gentleman, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I think in in terms of solutions, I mean, I think we've we've really learned um, from an immigrant rights perspective perspective in the last few years uh, the need to codify in statute much stronger protections for immigrant victims so that they <clears throat> excuse me so that they cannot be swept up, um, detained, and deported in spite of the existing protections. Um, you know, when, when we have um, uh, presidential administrations who have so much power and discretion over how immigration law is handled, 
especially with respect to detention and deportation and treatment of asylum seekers, you know, that's really a signal to us that we need protections that can survive any presidential administration. Um, and we need Congress to codify these protections, strengthen these protections, um, you know, make it impossible for a victim of human trafficking, let's say with a pending T visa to be detained and removed. Um, to prohibit the detention and, and removal of victims of human trafficking. Um, you know, we need pressure on the Biden administration to roll back the horrific regulations surrounding asylum. So the, the recent regulations surrounding asylum do a whole host of things. Um, but one of the things that is most harmful is that it makes it virtually impossible for anyone to get asylum if the government itself of the home country is not the bad actor. So for the, you know, even if they're complicit or turning a blind eye. And what that means is for victims of human trafficking who are fleeing uh, to this country for safety and protection, um, they're not eligible for asylum, as I mentioned before. So we need to pressure the Biden administration to roll back these asylum regulations to cancel these asylum reg regulations um, so that victims of human trafficking and others fleeing persecution have even an opportunity to apply for asylum. And lastly, as Claudia mentioned, um, you know, the, the structure of the work visas in the United States um, are just create the perfect storm for exploitation, right? Not only are our B1 domestic worker visas tied to the primary B1 holder, which is usually a family, right, that brings in a domestic worker, but our agricultural visas, our H2A visas, um, the vast majority of our labor visas are directly tied to that employer. And so we're putting victims in a situation where they risk, you know, either decide to stay and do the best that you can or leave that employer and be deported because your visa is directly tied to that employer. Um, and that takes congressional action. So we would encourage you all to reach out to your representatives and request that um, work visas, and there, has been there have been plenty of proposed legislations to do this, to untie a, um, work visas from the employer, right? To allow for portability, to, uh, to um, take away the risk of detention and deportation if you leave an employer who is trafficking you or otherwise exploiting you. Such concrete calls to action and things that we can do together, advocacy. So much that we can iterate and continue to do. Um, please, I, I, I hopefully we'll get to, we, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, if you have any more, put them into the q and I'll try really hard to get to them. And we're going to launch poll number three. These are really important. If you didn't already um, answer on the second poll, if you want to be connected with any of our panelists or our keynote afterwards, um, you can let Carolina know. Uh, many of you are asking about um, training and there, there, there's great training going on and um and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end um before we start the q a and we'll be welcoming you cheryl to join the panelists in the q a i want to say that we have uh, one of the great stars i guess global stars who happens to live in the south florida community dr brooke bellow who many 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 of you know who uh, does incredible work she has developed with her techie side of her brain a, a, a new app it's going to be uh, a, a tool not only for uh, case management and service providers, but also for um, survivors, victims, people who are experiencing uh, human trafficking. And it's an amazing app, and she's in doing her beta with it right now. And so uh, we're sharing those resources because many, many, many of you here um, uh, our, our colleagues are know uh, Dr. Bell and may be interested in, in testing and working on development of that app. And you can see Savella here, More to Life. Um, she's posted that in the chat. So thank you all. And now we are going to go on to the Q&A. And um, I'm going to start with the first one. It's for you, Molly. Um, 
Can you tell us a little bit about which children are more likely to be targeted? Are their families, social factors are predictive or associated with uh, successful online trafficking? And I'm gonna combine yet another question. If you can say what um, specific games might be used. So those are both um, excellent questions. What I would say is to like in the form of online child exploitation, anyone's at risk. If you have a computer, if you have a phone, if you have a iPad, your child is at risk from being targeted by a trafficker online. So I wouldn't look as much into the, um, the makeup of um, the child, but just the outlet for the trafficker to um, contact the child through. Um, for the game itself, um, I'm not sure which exact game was used in that. We usually don't get told um, details about cases because that's pretty sensitive information. But what I would say is that um, be aware of all gaming systems that have specifically cameras attached to them. Um, that's a huge outlet for a trafficker to contact a child. Um, any situation where there's a camera attached to a device that has Wi-Fi and the ability to connect online, um, I would be cautious of using that and I would be cautious to watch your child as they um, partake in any of those gaming processes. Hey, can I add to that one, one quick note? Please. And, and I agree, I mean, parents, you need to know any electronic equipment your child has, you need to have there are apps that you can know when they go on it, how they go on it, who they're talking to, when they're talking to. You'd be surprised how many kids are being reached out every day. When you give your kid a, smart, a smartphone and you let them have a Facebook account, you just let billions of people access to your kid. And it's how you gotta look at it. And not all those people are good people. So you really need to be tight. You pay for the phone, you get to decide how it's used. If I may add also, um... We've noticed, and I'm a parent, so I'm speaking more from a hypersensitive <laughs> advocate who's also a parent. I have children ages 10 to 20. Um, they're playing the same exact game online. The 10 year old is playing, and my 20 year old's not playing a game that's, um, you know, Grand Theft Auto or what, you know, this is, you know, the, the farming game. Um, the YouTube videos they watch have comments and the 10 year olds are dying to write a YouTube video comment to the YouTuber and it's trolled by conversation starters. It is over and over again hard for me. My children live here, you know, they see what I do every day and it's still hard for me to say, I don't care what that other commenter said. You know, it's not the YouTube superstar talking to them. It's just someone else on that YouTube comment. And they just feel like there's a friend. I mean, this is something that infiltrates socially for our children. Um, so parents must be active. I still share my devices with my children. So any text I receive, my children see. And I think a lot of parents might have trouble with that. Um, but also any text they receive, I receive. Um, that's how tightly knit we are in this household. So every family has to make a choice. We need to be educated as Molly pointed out that it, it's in your home. It's already in your home. The risk is inside your home. And that's the, you know, the, the home and mark that needs to be said for all parents in education. Just real quickly to add, because Cheryl, this made me think of um, of this scenario, particularly um, when you also have someone commenting and connecting, um, they're not always who they say they are. So it's really important to note that there is no accountability for people proving who they really are online. Um, so just being very careful if this is a friend, if this is someone that they're connecting with and you see a profile picture, in this scenario, the profile picture was a young girl enticing a young child and um, it wasn't, it was a trafficker. And I believe he was in the ages of 50. So um, you really do need to be cautious about friends that are made online as well, um, because you really can't verify anyone's identity. 
Michelle, would you like to take this next question first? And then Claudia, maybe you, you have something to answer as well. Well, the question is what is being done at our Southern border to provide migrant workers with information on who they can talk to if they're trafficked? Um, nothing. I mean, the, the reality of what's happening in our southern border is that the entire asylum system has been shut down, right? Um, individuals are, are having to remain in Mexico in squalid conditions um, while they're waiting for their cases to be heard. Um, and, and children, however, um, the children who are permitted to seek their cases inside of the United States um, usually end up in detention centers run by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. In South Florida, we provide legal services to every single detained child. And part of the services that we provide are Know Your Rights presentations um, and one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations with every single child who is detained. And part of those services include asking them about who their sponsor is, who, do, who are they planning to be released to? Do they know this person? Um, has anyone talked to them about having to work off any debt, right? We've been able, fortunately, to stop the release of these children to traffickers um, and to refer some of these cases to law enforcement. Um, and so, you know, one of the really important things is, as Claudia mentioned before, is funding, right? Funding to ensure that every asylum seeker, every um, worker coming in with a work visa, every individual who is detained has access to competent legal counsel and information about their rights um, as workers um, under labor law and under immigration law, right? Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, no, nothing is done in terms of um, providing individuals from the government, nothing's done at the border to inform individuals about their rights as workers or um, their rights um, if they find themselves subjected to trafficking. Yeah, and I'll just add really quickly, you know, to my earlier point, they're not even given information about what their rights are to identify whether or not uh, they're victims of trafficking, right? Um, you know, they, it's it's just that simple. And and adding, which is sad for me coming from Homeland Security, and I'm not here to badmouth them, but there's so much work that needs to be done just educating at that level. The reason why probably they're not being told because they don't even know from that perspective when they come across. And that's not something of interest they're even thinking of. Because we're looking at them as, oh, you're invading our country. Not like, okay, human beings leaving or having issues. I mean, we just have so much like to understand trauma and how trauma affects people. Just, we're not being human about this. We're being like, I don't even say professional because to be professional, you have to be human. But when your leaders do not understand what you guys understand, this is why we have those issues. You know, and again, not to bad mouth, you know, HSI or Homeland Security, but those leaders only know what they know. A lot of times the guys on the ground know a little bit more, but it's hard to feed this information going up. That's why education is so important. Our senators, the people that are making these laws have to understand what we understand about human trafficking. So it can come down from the top a lot easier than going up. And you will see a lot more done from that perspective. We have a, another uh, question from Frank Pages about USCIS giving labor visa applicants victim rights at their consular interviews. Um, so we have seen, we did see an effort um, from the Department of State to provide um, B-1 domestic workers and um, other work visa um, applicants and at, when they go into their consular interview to be given information about their rights. Um, however, what we have seen is that um, it's usually this little pamphlet that is not very helpful at all and doesn't explain anything, right? Um, if more than if you find yourself exploited, you can call this number uh, inside the United States. But what does that mean? What are the consequences of that? Um, what exactly do these uh, rights entail? Does it mean that you're gonna be immediately de deported, right? These are all questions that need to be answered. Um, and, and yes, the Department of State should do a much better job I think um, educating uh, work visa 
um, applicants and recipients about their rights at the front before they leave their home country, right? At the consular offices when they're having their visa interview, there should be a whole section of that interview about what to do if you find yourself in these scenarios and explain what those scenarios look like. Because, you know, most people don't understand what human trafficking means. Like, what is the definition? What, what does forced labor look like? What does indentured servitude look like? You know, um, really explaining actual scenarios to individuals um, so they can easily identify them when they find themselves in those situations. I'm going to tie the next question, Claudia, if you can start and then go back to you again, Michelle, the, the, the two questions. First, Claudia, uh, how can we better advocate for vaccine distribution for at-risk frontline workers, particularly those who are potentially being trafficked or risk of being trafficked, and especially those who may be undocumented? And then morphing on into that for both of you, um, and, and ending with you, Michelle, how can we be more effective in showing politicians how more restrictive immigration regulations can be harmful to survivors? Uh, go ahead, Claudia, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a such a difficult and it's the question of, of the day, right? Um, you know, we see here in Florida just how abysmal vaccine distributions have happened, right? There were reports in multiple counties um, of the elderly having to camp out overnight um, and that there's no structure. And then there is at moment no accountability by our current governor um, on the situation and is, is saying, well, the hospitals know and the, and the health professionals professionals know the best way um, and they're not getting the support appropriate. And so I think um, like any advocacy, it's contacting your Congress people, it's contacting um, people you know, who represent you and and um, and making noise about about these issues that that we're facing. And you know, I even saw in in the news the other day. You know, a Nebraska governor said that he didn't want undocumented people to even receive vaccination, right? And so this rhetoric uh, against undocumented people um, is it continues to be pervasive, right? And so we need to continue being. Um, uh, advocates for undocumented people who are at risk of being trafficked, right? Their status alone um, sort of leaves them vulnerable to these situations. Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we saw how undocumented communities were left out of any COVID relief. Um, by the federal government and by some of our local governments, right? Um, and so in terms of vaccination, when we're seeing a governor who doesn't think that American citizen essential workers should be priority for vaccination, you know, it, it's, a, it's a pretty steep uh, hill to climb as we try to advocate for undocumented and essential workers to be vaccinated as well, right? Um, when, when, when the governor is refusing for for citizen essential workers to be vaccinated. But I think, you know, what we have found was, you know, particularly with respect to food banks and other alternative forms of relief is that advocacy with our local government works, right? Um, our, I think we, we, on this particular issue, we can be much more successful in the state of Florida by advocating to our county commissions, uh, to our municipal mayors, um, that every member of our community should have access to the vaccine and every member of our community should have access to any local COVID-19 relief. And briefly, Michelle, about how can we be more effective in showing politicians how more restrictive immigration regulations can be harmful to survivors of HT? Yeah, I mean, I think when you have a no holds barred enforcement perspective, right, where, um, you know, there, there are no, um, you know, for, for multiple presidential administrations, um, ICE in particular was kind of given guidelines as to these are the types of individuals that we would like to detain and deport. And it wasn't always perfect and, and a lot of families were harmed by it, but law enforcement was given, like any law enforcement, um, priorities for, um, uh, ICE enforcement uh, for detention and deportation. And when those priorities are taken away and federal law enforcement is told every single person that's in the United States on an expired visa or without authorization is a number one priority for detention and deportation, 
you put every survivor at risk, every survivor of human trafficking and every survivor of domestic violence um, who is now even more terrified to seek um, uh, to seek uh, justice against their abuser, to seek freedom from their abuser, right? It's, it's the same thing in the state of Florida now with SB 168, right? Where sanctuary cities have been outlawed. Um, you are gonna see a lot less um, confidence coming from the immigrant community in reporting trafficking and reporting domestic violence out of fear of the consequences of detention and deportation, right? And so this kind of enforcement focus, um, le leaving you know, humanitarian concerns behind um, and, and not providing a space for um, survivors to be considered not priority for enforcement or removal really just feeds the fire of exploitation and violence in, in our communities, right? Um, and, and affects everyone and survivors, I would say disproportionately even, right? But once it's clear that survivors are gonna be protected first, not d detained and deported first as, as they have been most recently, um, you know, with outreach and education and a change in enforcement priorities, you know, it, it makes us all safer. And, and Mar, real quick before you go on, and, and the only way we're gonna reach those people, the one thing that I love that we have with our organization, we have a legislative committee that understand those roles and processes to get things done. Every organization, in your fight needs to have a partnership with somebody working in those legislative areas to help you get your message to these people. And Women's Fund is going to be working stronger and stronger and more and more closely with you all in 2021. This is a, we're all going to be stronger together. So these next few minutes, tools and education, everybody's asking. So are there specific uh, tools Lauren's kids, Senator Lauren Book and their offices, thank you very much, joined us here today. This toolkit is amazing. Lauren's kids blueprint for building safer families. You can get it for free. It's amazing. Lauren's kids website and uh, Caro or, or, or Vivi, if one of you be so kind to, to find a link, but this is amazing for, for for kids of all ages, which is one of the questions that came there. For, for training, the South Florida Human Trafficking Task Force that Victor uh, started here, now coordinated by amazing Caridad Mas Bachelor, and many, many colleagues are on today. There are trainings that can be done on request. I'm gonna put a slide up later about um, an interfaith outreach, a training online that we're doing at the end of this month for faith-based communities to get human trafficking 101 and to start getting that idea of, yes, in my community, somebody's got to be able to be educated to see what might be going on. So not only their um, constituents or the members of their faith-based community uh, might know to where to go for help, somebody they feel comfortable with, but also to identify it within their own ranks. If it's your choir director, better for us to be um, really, really caring. And there's great training there. Christy House gives amazing trainings, cannot, all of us, and Christy has, I believe they're amazing professionals who are going to join us today. If they're not on now, they're working with somebody, but they give the absolute best trainings. Um, and we're happy to connect you all for anyone who wants uh, trainings. We're members of the South Florida Human Trafficking Task Force. We work with CVAC and the Miami Day Coalition. So um, very, very happy to connect uh, everyone. And, uh, tools. So I think, Cheryl, if we can go to you first, um, if you can, you know, give us ideas to what you're doing with uh, the outreach into the community and actions. Uh, you want to tell us once again what In Our Backyard can offer and what people can do? Yeah, our, our main focus has been training and mobilization. And through that, we have, you know, branched out with other specific programs. So through tra training law enforcement is one of our um, highlights in all of Oregon. That's where we're based, um, but we've done you know trainings across America. But what's unique that I think is a tool is identifying your outreach community, um, whether it's the church, whether it's um, teachers or you know parents, but 
ours is very unique. It's the convenience store staff and owners. Um, you know, they see over half the U.S. population every single day. And their marketing is that they care about the community, that they, they want to present themselves as a successful business who cares about the community. So we've identified um, that's a great partner to link arms with, to train staff, to provide a video of how to spot report human trafficking and identifying a network of people that becomes that you know, um, collective voice um, to understand the hotline number um, I love how Victor pointed out, you know, our statistics come from sometimes very small studies that then are broadcasted across the entire nation as, you know, as if it actually, the test group was more than 15 people only. Um, it's hard to predict a nationwide level of stats if our old statistics are based on groups under 100 people. Um, it's, it's a tough challenge. Um, one of the smaller studies was in 2016 that said, you know, the number one way to increase arrests of traffickers was to post the human trafficking hotline number. Um, so we've stuck to that, even though it's a, maybe a smaller number, but it's something of our why and what we do um, and helping others understand that survivors still say today, today we have a network of about 300 survivors who said they were in convenience stores every day, picking up hygiene supplies, whatever their needs were, sometimes maybe getting away from um, a motel or hotel, things like that. Um, but it becomes a safe place with a public restroom. And that's our focus. So just creating tools like the videos we have, materials that are free, right? We need to train people with free materials. Um, all this should just be provided for others. And then freedom stickers are the main sticker that we use across all the um, states. We're in all 50 states, over 500,000 of them are posted in public uh, restrooms and people wanna sign up and post stickers um, and help raise awareness about the hotline. It just you know, increases reporting. Um, we want survivors to notice the trust value um, that it's the same, you know, there's a couple other numbers out there, but that it stays you know, a few where we hope by the seventh time they've gone to a restaurant, uh, a restroom and seen that same sticker they'll finally decide to call, right? Um, we need to all work together and support 1-800-THE-LOST uh, and the National Human Trafficking Hotline number. These are all great things for us to come under and help showcase that and get the reports to increase again. And then finally, just our Teens Against Trafficking program, it does go um, as young, you know, as fifth grade if needed, um, but really just understanding how to traffic proof schools um, through their own students understanding the issue at a level um, that they can understand what the conversations between students talk about because students talk to students first you know they tell their problems to each other we are not involved as the adults uh, the teachers might get a clue um, but it's understanding um, as Victor pointed out it is the ground up right with students in the school so we have to bridge that gap between the top and the bottom there and really start to create videos that include students talking about it. And that's what we've focused on this year is can we put students behind the camera just like we're doing today? Um, because you can't pull students out all day to go do our facilitations in the school classrooms. But now with the power of Zoom and digital era, um, you know, we're able to pre-record post poll questions for the students and really give them an opportunity to not stay silent and just be able to ask more questions about maybe what they've seen within their peer groups um, and just approach that differently. So again, we're um, always collaborating with law enforcement, always collaborating with other nonprofits um, to identify how best we can continue developing our tools uh, to help get the, get the information and get people help when they need it. So to that incredible point that all of you have made, the Stronger Together, I have to say, it's an amazing resource here. I encourage our panelists to look. Um, uh, Javier Romani has posted here, he's a representative from an organization who works with peers in the disability community, which we know is an incredibly, incredibly uh, vulnerable, at-risk, community that we need to make sure and engage with. So I know all of you are writing down quickly, how do we keep um, 
in, in contact with Javier, thank you so much for being here. We are only stronger when we're together and this changes every day. If we have a, 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 a human trafficking uh, focus group in 20, 2019, it's different from 2021, right? And, and mid year, it's gonna be different. But now that we've come out of COVID, we're coming out of COVID, we have to be prepared for the COVIDs to come. Whatever is going to be happening in the future, we need to be out in front of it. And how do we get out in front of it is by communicating what's going on, keeping in touch with you all and you all who are tuned in today. And we keep on communicating and working stronger together. These what you should know, what you can do cards are always iterated. We've given out like 80,000 in the last seven, eight years, and they change all the time. Coordinated Victim Assistance, Assistance Center is there, 911, 211. There's a way to get to everyone here, but people need to know that somebody is ready to help. So please share the information, share the information. You will be put in contact with the panelists if you, if you said that you would like to be put in touch with their organizations. We're working on forging ever stronger fabrics in our community. And we do that all by sharing. Um, we will come together the first Thursday of, um, of every month uh, to talk about the different topics that affect uh, women and girls and anybody affected by the gender lens. And in April, we're going to do that in, in our signature fundraiser, The Power of the Purse, and we're going to focus on leadership there. So you're the first ones to know we have a date, folks, April 8th, 2021, with some amazing speakers and a real possibility for everybody to engage together. So we're respectful of everyone's time. Panelists, you're amazing. Uh, community. You are amazing. Thank you all so much. And keep on sharing your data with us. Dr. Elcheva is going to help us to put it all together and share it back into the community. So you'll keep on hearing from us more. Have an amazing, amazing beginning of this new year, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. And thanks to all the panelists. Great work. Thank with you. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Claudia, Michelle, Molly, and Cheryl, thank Bye. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Claudia, Viviana, Carolina, interns.